think I wanted to exchange bishops here. But this is a well-known pattern, so that makes sense. just wins a pawn. It's pretty easy. is even under consideration. Theater Master, welcome. Oh, I ran out of time. It was rookie eight. I was thinking rookie eight, but like I come on to mull it over. I was thinking that even if they come back and attack F seven, I can just break out and then they're playing with three they're playing with four against two on the king side. Which is probably more tolerable than allowing a pass pawn on the queen side. Here maybe king f6, rook f7, king e5, and they can't play rook h7 immediately. They'd probably have to play like e4, 
I guess. And then there's time to play h5 and make just make it very difficult to actually win. Um, there's also rook e7. This is probably more simple. So let's do that. King of six is probably just too desperate as a first move. Well, if they sit here and wait, <coughs> Probably it should be like king g2 and f3. Create another pass pawn. Well, potential pass pawn. Could also play g5, just lock this whole thing down. But that does also create a target, so I don't see any reason not to start with king g2. The reason I thought g5 first might not be the move is they could play h6 here. And after I play like h4, takes, takes. Maybe they could play rook h8 and rook h5 to try to win this pawn. It looks a little bit like counterplay. So there's h6. I think I have to play this. Yeah, in the comments it says, hard to attack the g5 pawn with the bishop. Yeah, obviously. Uh, I guess allowing rook f7 would be really bad, so this this is clearly good. G5 g is sort of an obvious move. So here we could play like rook d5, force h6. Rook e5. Which probably allows like a small amount of counterplay. I think if I had already passed a pawn, I might be more willing to just go in that pawn. Probably fine. Well, there's no time really. Alright, so, so we should tie down the bishop instead. We don't need to take the e-pawn right away. Now we can take it. I wonder if the next variations will show why we're not just taking this pawn. Because black's position has so many weaknesses. Like if I play bishop e4, they can't. I don't think they can even really get away with um, rook a8 because there's rook f7, king f7, bishop a8, and that should be a winning opposite bishop endgame. I'm pretty sure. Might be worth looking at real quick. <clears throat> Let me um, make a duplicate scene so that this is not so ugly to look at. One second, guys. All right, I'm gonna fix this up real quick. I don't know how useful that bottom part is. I guess we'll see. Um, and I want what I want to get here is the engine and stuff, so you guys can see it. Dude, I'm not gonna juggle that many windows. Is is the chessable uh, engine that bad? I, I really just want to like make some moves on a board. I don't really care that much how strong it is. I think it'll figure it out. Alright, first of all, let's see if um, 
toggling the engine looks good in here. Looks all right, yeah. Okay, so engine is on. Um, too bad I can't make this board bigger. It's pretty minuscule. It looks way better in my OBS than it does in the actual window. Um, which I would say is just a little bit more of my gripe with Chessable. When they first launched, I, I got their membership to support the launch because I thought it was going to be a big thing. And it is basically the same as it was the day that it the day I got my membership. Although they have been putting out these pro courses in the last like week as if to say, we're sorry. So um, that's kind of nice. This one that I'm looking at right now is a pro one. Um, if you don't have the paid membership, you can't get this book. So anyway, here I was thinking if they played this, if I can just take this like that, and that this is completely winning. Yeah, just looking at it, it's pretty obvious, right? We have we have a pass pawn ready to roll. And if I it's so annoying how I can't go back and edit the position. So let me go move back. Do the same thing. Does it look good? Alright, it's still there. Okay, so here I was thinking I could just take this. It has the same evaluation according to the Stockfish Engine Boy thing. So there's rookie eight, bishop d five, and rookie seven, which is very much the same. It's like, um, well, first of all, if I take this, it's it's a much worse version of the other end game because we don't have the f pawn on top of everything. Like you can play this, but I don't think it's promising against a strong player. Um, but you know, if we just keep the the rooks on the board here, it's going to be very hard for Black to extricate themselves. I don't believe in this position at all. It's suggesting the top move is this. And then king back to g7. Or like more waiting. With so many weaknesses on the board, I just don't don't think it's gonna gonna work. Like let's say I play um Yeah, let's say I just play like king f3 and they they make some waiting moves here. And I play this and I go back and I play h4. And they wait some more. I also could have stopped them from waiting like this if I play rook g8 first. Like they have no targets on the back rank. So I think now I can play this and they have to take it pretty much because if they play a waiting move here and allow h5, they're pretty close to losing this h pawn. Let me see. So let's say they wait some more. Their king basically just can't move anymore. So I could probably improve my king somehow. Anyway, I think this is a bit too much. So we'll just come back to the actual book. Sorry, looks like trash right now. Give me a sec. Yeah, bishop c2, rook h8, that's, that's definitely an angle to, to look at there. I, th I think white has plenty of things, and black can only sit. We just have to figure out the right synthesis and um, timing for our, our own ideas. Really just playing for, like, two results here. In a great position, not material. Like, seems good. Hmm. Probably just play bishop d5. 
when I get low on time, I'm playing bishop d5. But they have to play either bishop e7 or rook e7. Probably I can trade rooks and play king d3. Like take, bishop takes, king d3. You know, they can play a move. King f6, king c4, king e5. I'll probably play bishop um, b3. If they play king e4, well, actually, hold on. King f4. I could probably play bishop f3 instead. I don't think it's important to keep an eye on the f-pawn necessarily. Actually, I could just take on f7. So they can't really play this like king e5 stuff. But if they wait with a bishop, we play king b5, bishop c5, and then a5. So I think this is it. This has the same idea. I just wanted to do it with my king. Get more material off. I guess this is more precise because um, keeping the rooks on with opposite bishops is, is generally favorable for the attacking side. Terry says there's a cute sequence here. I think it's kind of funny when people call chess moves cute. It's like, wow, I can really tell you get out much. Maybe e4. Just going out on a limb here. Um, Let's throw that in. Okay. Looking at e5. And rook g6 is the only move, pretty much. And then bishop e4 is a thing, but then there's rook e6. I don't see anything wrong with just getting e5 in here and then improving the king. So I'm going to play that if I get low on time. I'm pretty much there now. Okay, rook f4 didn't look that challenging to me. Bishop c6 is a move. I mean, why not? Yeah, I'm not seeing anything except bishop c6. I mean, there's also rook a7, but I don't see any reason to move the rook when it's more or less optimally placed. Oh, the rook is positionally trapped with bishop e4. Stuck. Yeah, that's a good way of defending the pawn.
it's kind of tempting to play just king e4 and then king e5 and if they play rook g6 then bishop e4 so maybe I'll go for that okay so here we're doing the same deal actually mm -hmm. because if they play rook f3 then king e2 kind of obvious it's a double attack it's like almost not worth showing this um He says bishop g3 is better, so I'm confused about why they don't show that as the main move. And now king c4. Rook takes, rook takes, and this is still good. Yeah, I think that variation just answered your question, Uter Master. The commentary says this move is impatient, but I just don't see why this is impatient. <laughs> For instance, king e5, bishop c3 makes sense. I might play f4. I thought f4 was a logical move, more or less throughout. Um, it was probably important not to allow it. Maybe that's what's impatient about this. I'm losing on time, so I play f4. I don't lose a pawn, and here I think I should also just, you know, not lose that pawn, so I'm pushing it. Okay. <coughs> now that rook could go to d6, but then we play rook f7, so they're pretty much tied down here. So we could play maybe like king... I was thinking king d5, but you have to go back to d4 anyway. I don't know, it's kind of hard to bring the king usefully to the queen side here. There is a, a sort of formulaic way that this could go, though, generally speaking. Like, if I can cross the b4 square then and get my king to b5, I can play bishop d5 to c6 and take this. And even if a bishop comes and takes it, this outside pass pawn is going to decide the game. Oh, speak of the devil, I think this is it. Now I need to win, so I don't think promoting is it. We need to protect this pawn. F6 doesn't do it, so I think it's bishop e4. But then after bishop e4, king f4... I guess we drop back with like bishop c2 so that in the next couple of moves we're playing king b7 and a8. Could maybe also play bishop d7 and just not deal with any nonsense. Bishop d7, rook d8, that might be kind of annoying. Bishop e4, looks right. All right. They prefer bishop d7. I'm not sure it really matters. I just didn't really want to deal with rook d8. Because if rook d8, king b7, then it's rook d7 check. So we play king c7, then king b7. It's not a big deal. I knew the winning idea right away, so I'm, I'm cool with that outcome. So we can't really make any bishop moves here. We could just play a5 and a6, like just keep going. Yeah, like what's the worst that could happen? So a5, king g4, 
a6, rook f5 check, king c4, I guess. No, maybe, maybe just king a4. That could be annoying, but I think I have to do this in time pressure. So a5, I'm losing this pawn. I could potentially play bishop to d7. That might force some things. Bishop d7, they have to like king g5, probably. But then we're not getting a6, a7. Vedant, welcome. Yeah, we have a pretty good, pretty good number of uh, subscribers. Yeah, we could celebrate somehow. I feel like we just did a, a good thing though with this um, the fan fight invitational arena. It's not exactly like the grand finale of the the fan fight deal. I think that a lot more is gonna come up, so we could probably schedule another one um, in anticipation of hitting one and a half thousand. Okay, so here we're just gonna push this pawn, right? Like king c6. They're probably gonna wait, like bishop b8 or something. And we could probably go win this pawn or something like that. Or maybe just break through. King c6 is definitely tempting. Like, do a little zigzag here. Okay, they want a6. I think they're just being a little bit picky in the variations here. Really, I don't think it matters. Yeah, thanks for posting that, Vedant. By the way, did, did both August and Russian Bias already uh, qualify for the Invitational? I think they did, but... Um, if either of them did not, they should qualify now that they are like joint first, second in the arena. And if and if you missed why they got joint first and second, Vedant, you should definitely check out the end of that um, arena tournament. I think the rest of the commentary is pretty good too, um, but the finale was pretty funny. Okay, so let's see. So the commentary says we should prevent unnecessary counterplay. I don't see why I can't just push this pawn. This is important. Improving the rook by getting rid of it. Okay. It's true, though, that I think when your pawns are more than four files apart in the opposite color bishop endgame, you have really high winning chances. So they definitely can't take it. They still can't. No, they can't take this pawn. I was thinking maybe we could try to force trade rooks with this threat. But if they do, and we only have one pawn left, we're not winning. So. Yeah, Vedant, I think that would be cool if we let um, Wombat qualify. That would be their their consolation prize. Not that they need consolation, you know, I'm sure they're fine with the result. Alright, maybe don't lose this. Okay, so we protect this way. There's a little bit too much prophylaxis for my liking here. <laughs> Taking so long to play a6. Well, 
But you know what? Eventually it has to happen. So I was guaranteed to get at least one move right in this sequence. Okay, this is almost the end of the book. The powerful F8 queen. Yes, triple attack. Just kidding. Um, it's probably like a7. a7, they take. f7, they take. I get a queen. That looks pretty good. Queen and bishop against rook and bishop. I think it should be winning. Probably not trivial though. Okay, so f7, probably with the same concept in mind. I think it's more or less the same. If I promote on f8, they take on d3, that, that actually still should win after king c2, right? Queen, they take, king c2, bishop takes his, no, actually, queening is check. That's important. I don't see any reason not to queen with check. I've been, I almost said that I've been playing so badly this week, but it's more like I've been solving so badly this week. I should probably consider why that might be the case. Missing stuff like checks, occasionally seeing illegal moves. Not great. This is the whole game that this uh, little tiny free book is based off of. I think, actually this one might not be the, um, the pro, yeah, actually this is a pro special. It says it in the thumbnail. So it, this is definitely something that was for pro members only. So if you guys don't have um, Chessable Pro, you won't even see this book, I bet. Unless they're just taunting you by like waving it in your face, like, neener, neener, you don't have this book. Which I think is not beneath uh, chess marketing people. This is a nice moment where he just trades into this endgame with Rook C5. Definitely worth looking at. Um, I have a couple qualms with um, their choices of hard fail, fail moves in this small book, but I would definitely recommend this to anyone. This is a nice little book. Sometimes less is more. And we just did all this, so it's going a little bit quickly to show how it's all connected. couple small details were left out here, like all this protracted king maneuvering to bring it to b5. Some of the positions have multiple solutions, but the one given is nice, so it doesn't really matter. Um, Jakester, welcome. Um, the free lessons do not require pro membership, but they've introduced um, some lessons that are only for pro members so it might be moving in that direction but I think there will always be some free books on chessable that's probably the main draw all right this is their short and sweet triangle slot which I also haven't finished so we can look at that real quick this is just opening stuff so I'm going to make moves and not really read the commentary too much Usually the commentary is kind of garbage for the opening books. A lot of the, the content of this book is derived from correspondence chess, also known as adult humans spending gratuitous amounts of time um, getting to know their engines extremely well and then using it against other adult humans using engines. And um, a lot of top level opening trends follow the um, correspondence games. But some things are just kind of good for engine play and not really great over the board. I think Triangle Slav and Note Boom are the same exact opening because they keep using these words interchangeably throughout the book. Either way, this is not really something that I know very well. 
So I'm, I'm kind of curious about how generally one plays positions that arise from capturing on c4 early, like in the Queen's Gambit, accepted. So I thought this book would be interesting even if I never, never really use it. So somewhat surprisingly, we don't take on e4. What a surprise. I'm as shocked as you are, really. He says the position is probably around equal, but if anyone is better, it's surely black with the pass pawn. Um, you sure about that? <laughs> that pawn is all by itself, after all. Uh, where were we? I think we played these things. Oh, e yeah, knight c5 first, and then this. And trades McGee, and then this, and then that, and then this, and that, and then this. Oh, wait, we take first. Oh no, I lost a pawn. Oh no, my queen. Um, no boom is a Dutch name, Jakester. The downstairs to sleep is such a mess. Yeah, I mean you were just in Las Vegas. By the way, how did you like the how did you like the trip? Okay, where were we with this one? I think it was knight c five. Yes, good. And then we protect. Then we push. And then we take to open some lines and be annoying. And then we don't drop our queen, and then we say, oh no, my queen. Just kidding. Trade everybody. No boom is a pretty funny um, name, though, I have to admit. I have a soft spot for Las Vegas, I have to admit. Um, although it is kind of a dirty, uh, not so great place to be. It's definitely a morally dubious place to hang out. And yeah, smoking everywhere is such a... Such a hazard to deal with. <laughs> Alright, Jakester made a funny comment. He said that he thought we had finally reached the point where variations are named after some online guy instead of a duke from the 17th century. Well, I'm not sure if that's an improvement or worse. Um, to have that be the situation if it comes to pass. Although I, I have recently heard people unironically citing games from uh, PogChamps as their source for opening theory. So anything's possible, really. Um, even the, the renaming of uh, old chess variations. Perhaps we'll even see the, the cancellation of chess players. Although I think that many chess players are relatively immune to the, the cancel culture because they didn't do anything really interesting except play chess a lot of the time, as far as I know. But you never know. You never can tell. All right, what's it say here? The main to be of the note boom variation. Always nice to see loan words from Arabic, seriously. There's not a lot of them. Um... He said, this is a giant shortcut. People do play this a lot. And the rest is just like flowery language saying how, how great it is that people have played this position before. We do a little fight here for the bishop pair. Get our knight to a, a snug place to be in the meanwhile. All right, so we started with bishop e4, exclaim, according to the author. Um, some bullying occurs. I think that their commentary is kind of not doing justice to the subtlety of the move orders here, but whatever. Um, I'm kind of just casually passing through this book. I would definitely do a deep dive if I planned on actually learning this. But it's it's also good to know what other people are attempting to learn. Oh, I made a made a faux pas there. 
um, because it can help you to predict trends that might benefit you even if you're not playing the variation itself. I don't know why I gave up on playing the, the right move at the end there. Okay, so here's our triangle. Avoiding the martial gambit. Knight c3, c6, e4. He said players trying to avoid the theoretical discussion that arises have tried to sidestep with bishop b4, but it's not a great choice um, because white gets additional options like bishop d2, citing this position. Claims that this transposes to the main lines. Um, and this is a dangerous pawn grab. It's reminiscent kind of of the Scandinavian, or maybe there are some gambit lines where like white just gives up this deep pawn, allows queen d4, and then the queen has to run back and they get a lot of counterplay. Author claims that without bishop b4, white would simply be doing great. I think that really depends on, a lot on the concrete details. Um, but, you know, if we just level with them here. Kramnik played c5 here in the candidates of 2018. I think I remember that. I'm not really too interested in the rest of that commentary. And Carlson had this position with white against Anand in 2013. So I've definitely seen this before. I've noticed that end games like this with a pawn on c4 are often favorable for black. So I, I can kind of believe this. It's interesting though that I think they might have been a pun down even. Um, let's quickly get back to that position and check it out. Here we're not even crippling the pawn structure with bishop c3, we're just chilling. Yeah, we're a pawn down, but it's still a good, good version. Curious when that happens. This actually reminds me somewhat of a recent tournament game that I had. I had maybe an even worse version of this as white. Well, similar. All right, good night, Vedant. Hope your sleep schedule gets fixed. I never really get shaken by the time zone changes. It's kind of weird. It could just mean that my sleep schedule is already so bad that like it can't get worse or something. I'm not sure. Um, okay, so we're we're using tactics. I don't see any reason not to. So I'm cool with this position. Yes, dim rim knights, but we tempo. We like tempo. Yeah, Bishop F8 is a funny move. I've definitely seen this position before. Yeah, this is all sharp stuff. I wouldn't mind navigating this position, even if I didn't know what was going on. This is one of those swift draws of chess, I think. It's a little nuts to play king c3.
Oops, e5 first. Do I have to bring the light square bishop? Potentially. I think it was... Knight c5, yeah. Yeah, Jake Stern. Um, my sleep schedule also goes through massive swings between weekdays and the weekend. Well, it, it did more when I was actually like teaching chess regularly because I would work like more than 12 hours on the weekend days and then just after school during the weekdays. So there was never a consistent, it wasn't really like more or less. It was just like different hours each time. It was pretty annoying. So Bishop E2 is a critical reply, obviously. So we want to play Knight E7, but we don't want to lose a Rook, so we, we play this. So if they castle long here, we have Bishop F5. Checkmate, pretty much. Well, they could play bishop d3, but then I guess we have queen takes g, no, maybe queen f4. Yeah, probably like queen f4. Actually, can we even play bishop f5 after castling here? Bishop d3 looks kind of annoying. Queen f4, bishop d2. Queen takes f2, rook f1 maybe. Hmm. There's queen g2. I guess it's something concrete here. So e5 is the move either way. Looks like a good move. So we're putting both of our knights on the edge of the board in their suggested line. This also looks kind of like a draw offer. So if they take this rook, then bishop f5 wins. Always nice to give people optimistic variations to get their hopes up. fall for this. This threatens me. Obviously we block it. If we play knight e7, we lose our ability to castle because the knight is hanging on e7. And yeah, there's a good question here. If they take on a5, what happens? This threatens mate, we avoid mate, and the problem is that c6 can't be defended anymore, which makes a lot of sense because when they play queen d6, c6 is already barely hanging on, so good not to get too materialistic. We're bringing our king close enough to guard this knight. And we don't let them do anything over here. No fun for them. A 
lots of compensation for the exchange. No checkmate. No winning on c6. No taking on g7. Just say no. No taking the bishop. No taking the knight. No taking the knight again. But finally we can say yes to big compensation. No. 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 Yes. The most natural move, bishop d6. The most natural move, allowing queen takes g2. They have to play bishop f3, I don't think. They have much of an alternative, unless it's a super dynamic option. So we go to an active spot. We have to move the queen again anyway, so it doesn't really matter that it's easy to attack on g5. Either way, it needs to be moved. Okay, so more sacrificing. If they played rook g7, we'd play knight f5. But now after knight f4, I guess we don't want to allow that to be in the air too long. Throw up material so we can give this back. Take, go here. Of course, what else? Do this and that and this and that and this, of course, and then that. And we give an exchange again. Gimme. Thank you. I guess we want a castle, but our knight's hanging. This is another good reason to play knight g6 and knight f4. Alright, Jakester's wondering if I am concerned with why alternative moves are out of theory, or do I find it expedient to just remember and justify the correct moves? I find it extremely important to consider alternative moves and why they might not be theory, and if they should be new theory, and if they're refuted or not. Um, I spent a lot of time on that, but right now I'm just kind of reading this book in a really leisurely way. Um, and I am actually reading the text. You might notice that there are some side variations. I just don't remark on all of them out loud, but I'm, but I'm reading them, and some of them are interesting. Like this one was making some notes about, um, or the last one was making some notes about like Sherbakov's suggestions. You can see that here. Um, so I read that, I thought it was interesting, but not worth commenting on. Not in this sort of speedrun-esque bedtime story of chess. All right, so now we're stonewalling. This is, it's always fun and interesting when the stonewall pops up. You could visualize a stonewall literally popping up if you like, as you doubtless lull yourself to sleep with chess books. Apparently knight f6 is called slow slough. Is it really that slow? characterizes the the resulting positions as having slim winning chances 
with dry positions. I'm not sure that's really true. Like, his, I imagine this guy, um, Lamy, has read Shanklin's book on the semi slot, or at least knows it exists. But this sounds like a very hot take. I think it's interesting when people in chess use the word ambitious to describe what they are um, proposing because sometimes the move that or actually quite often the move that they call ambitious doesn't really look like much um, but I, I think it often makes sense when you think about it in terms of ambition in your chess opening position is trying to get the most out of the position which entails a certain degree of risk so by playing f5 it's ambitious in the sense that you are accepting some temporary weakness and lack of development to try to establish a formation which is perhaps going to yield greater winning chances if you survive to establish that setup. And it's, it's also accepting that this bishop will be bad long term, which the author acknowledges in the notes. He's quoting a book from quite a long time ago, I believe. Agnestine's Win with the Stonewall Dutch. I think that's a book from like before I even learned how to play chess. I'm not sure though. <clears throat> I've read like one opening book ever, I think. Which was Pirates Alert by Lev Albert. I think it's Lev Albert. I'm not sure I even read the whole thing. Oh, I also read a piece of uh, some basically a compilation of engine lines about the Poison Pawn Nidorf. That was pretty pretty much a huge waste of time for me, at least at the time when I was reading it. Yeah. Lamy admits to having played F takes G4 at some point. But of course there's nothing wrong with this position. And here's an example of excessive ambition. Um, this would be a really good move in the sense that the knight is well placed on d5. And if they took it, it could be replaced with the queen with full control of the white squares. But the problem here is the move e4. And like pretty much any move, they're going to play queen h5. Like So here it takes queen h5. Oops, I didn't mean to go so far. And after g6, we have our standard queen e5 memes. So it, it pays to um, know some tactical motifs here. This comes about in the scholar's mate lightning attack. And um, it, it's just good to know that it exists. So watch my recent video where Samantha is learning all about that stuff if you want to see how these beginner concepts can appear even in opening theory at a high level. That one's about the, the basic ideas. This is the ostensibly high level opening theory. It's interesting how this position actually closely resembles a Dutch now, but one where white has played g4 instead of g3. And then move e3 instead of like maybe knight f3. I often see a Dutch where black plays f5 in response to any kind of aggression with d5 and even though their their bishop on e6 looks kind of stupid it does have a future as we'll probably see in this book um but this d5 advance is often pretty pretty disruptive of white's attempts to play actively which is of course nice for black The author has some harsh words there for white's position. We develop knights before bishops, typically. No more pressure on d5, that's why we're playing bishop b4. It 
to stop this knight from ever disturbing d5. But I, I expect that white will get the bishop pair, and the position may become suspect once again for other reasons. So, we've already seen this. Um, this comment seems interesting because it says that this is borrowed from the Queen's Indian in Catalan, where this is a typical maneuver. I think I would hesitate to um, call this an original idea or something borrowed from somewhere else. It's really like such a basic thing to develop your bishop that hasn't moved yet, check the king, and then deal with the consequences. Um, but yeah, he's saying either like force force white to put a minor piece on on d2 and he says it's not being recommended because of bishop d2 bishop retreating because like black is spending an extra move but white's bishop is maybe not where they want it to be which is probably a3 or b2 but then after this move um bishop d4 is on tap anyway so you have to start reacting And white has a pretty solid stonewall-y situation occurring. And maybe they could achieve uh, g4 under more favorable circumstances if they don't choose to just, like, castle and chill out. Where were we? So I think we did this one first. No, we threw this check first. No, this first. And then... Oh, we're on the next one. Okay. That was practice for some reason. All right, so now we're following along. It's very normal in like apparently several kinds of structures to play queen e7 against b3. pretty snazzy position on the queen side I have to admit so we're still doing this we ball with knight of six we develop our bishop we play I think castling first or queen e7 first doesn't really matter we take this um, b6 before we develop the knight okay and then we're playing this in order to play a way we take and then play c5. Right. Yeah, that happened. Okay. I didn't mean for this to be a how to play the Stonewall Dutch session, but, you know, I'm cool with however it turned out. All right, we castle now. And then we go there. This is clearly in the spirit of the note boom. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, that's the variation that arises after we take on c4, so go figure. This is the kind of situation that I'm actually really interested in figuring out more about. Uh, from this short little book. White has no way to recoup the c4 pawn and continues with the natural move, bishop g2. Um, I like this where it's comparing to the Catalan. I don't know like anything about the Catalan. I've just never had to think about it, really. Um, this is an interesting move.
and he says that white has a strong initiative and the advantage because black can't really play bishop b7 or a6. So it's probably good to be super cautious if you play this in a move order where you already have bishop b7, for example, and you want to take on c4 and play b5. I think I've made that mistake a couple times, which is where my interest um, stems from for this little book. He says, in our possession, the key difference is that white puts a lot of pressure on the queen side immediately before kingside castling in the Catalan. Um, but for us, because we haven't played knight f6 yet, we have some kind of extra options. Apparently, a 495 and castling don't have any independent value. So, so they're giving castling as the main move order. And they claim that these things transpose a lot. So let's see it. I thought they just said that our advantage in this line is that we haven't played knight f6 yet. They suggest starting with this instead of bishop b7, even though the difference is small. So they're both playable in this case. It's not like just becoming a Catalan. Okay, this is getting into sharp territory already. I've never seen this idea in practice. Interesting. We should defend the bishop. I'm gonna put the bishop on a if I had to guess. Yeah. We're gonna possibly lose an exchange, but then like we're gonna be winning the c6 pawn and finishing development, so that seems pretty good. Interesting position. So they said do this anyway. Oh no, we're taking first. Do this anyway. Well b5 and then that. Don't lose the b-pawn. And then we're going to do the aggressive boy thing. Defend that b-ship. Um, develop our b-ship. And then put the bishop on a8. Let the good means roll. Alright, I'm mostly interested in what happens... I guess because this is the short and sweet version, they're not going to cover the line I really care about. Hmm. Where they don't play b3, and they just play it as if it was a Catalan. Maybe this will look like that. Let's see. We've already seen this kind of commentary. This Something very close to this position can arrive in the semi-slav. Pretty easily, actually. And if you're wondering why you can't just play b5 here, it's because after queen c2, bishop b7, and e4, um, black never manages to get c5, according to the author. And here we play b5. I guess because g3 is a walking contradiction with the move e4. It's not really explained. Here we're not playing b5 and we go knight d7. In the main course they say they explain all that. So 
this I think we're getting to the part where they inevitably just make plugs for the main course. Like you've read so much and clearly you want to know more, so uh buy my book. Um This is very similar to stuff that happens in the semi sloth. We have the bishop pair, which is always nice. We like it. We like it a lot. It's good. Okay, check and do these. And throw these one and deflection and take the pawn. All right, we'll do this first. It's the same. A long and bitter line. Yeah. So this is Carl's bad stuff. I wonder if they have anything interesting to say about it. He says we can get in different move orders. Cross bed structure, black's ideal development scheme involves putting bishops on d6 and f5. Most active squares possible. Makes sense. Um, one way that people sometimes will characterize this is by saying whichever way your pawn structure faces, you want your bishops to face with it. Um, this applies especially well in the Carlsbad structure. White will often go for a minority attack with the bishops going this way. It doesn't necessarily hold in most structures, but Carlsbad it definitely does. Without c6 already in play, queen b3 is a problem. Yeah, tactical stuff. It happens all the time. Um, he goes into some detail about that. All right. This is an important detail, I think, that um, we don't necessarily want to start in with knight f6 because... In order to escape from this pin, we have to forego the most active placement of the bishop. So with move order tricks, we can probably um, circumvent this problem. All right, we take back. Bishop f4 is not um, that critical. Naturally, they give the least critical things in the short and sweet version because they want you to buy the book. It's a little fishy to um, trade your better bishop sometimes, but they don't really have any great way to punish it. Like here, they should probably just do the same. And we have an equal position. Thank you for following MCAT. The MCAT sounds like an exam that you don't really want to deal with. But spelled phonetically. Is it called the MCAT, the test that they give to the people trying to go to med school? I'm trying to remember. Jake Star, are you actually studying for the MCATs? <laughs> Sorry if I disappoint you, MCAT. Um, I'm reading a chess book, and I think you could construe that as a chess bedtime story. And Jakester, um, yeah, I know you're an engineer, so I was kind of surprised when you said you got to study for my MCATs. I wondered if you had suddenly a, a change of heart and uh, wanted to take people's pulses and things like that. But yeah, this is pretty. This is as close to a chess bedtime story as I get usually. Um, Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual is for sure something that can put you to sleep along with most reference books um, I would recommend 
think it's called Pocket Guide. Like it's a reference book that's about this big, and it's got lists of all kinds of things that you never knew you needed in there. So, if you need something to get you to sleep in, you know, under five minutes, that's definitely one, one to pick. Okay, so Rook B1. We're not gonna let them do it. Not easily anyway. This is a nice structure. I always want to get this when people play the English, but I muck it up every time. Okay, and now we don't let them put their bishop on a good square. Get rid of it. One of these, wham bam, thank you ma'am. Probably don't let them play 95. We're just saying no, you know, just say no. It's like dare all over again. Um, we do a little waiting. We throw on b5 and get that nice structure on the queen side. And some of these, and some of these. Alcibiades, okay, we stop before. They insist, we do waiting move because we actually like this one. I think the reason that um, A takes B4 is an alternative move is that they probably don't want to take with um, the rook on B4, so it ends up being the same anyway. Okay, so here we have knight f3, trying to stay flexible. And they're giving bishop f5 as their main. I feel like there's probably some kind of move order where this is a redundancy within the course, but um, I don't have the full course, so I'll never know. And I'm kind of cool with that. I think we're nearing the end of this short book, though. Alright, it says knight f6 is more flexible, it allows for sharper play. Probably by provoking white to play queen b3 under some circumstances that might not be desirable. This looks a lot like the Nimzo. Or Ragozin. I still don't know the difference between the Nimzo and the Ragozin. They're both openings where you play bishop b4 against d4, in my mind. So we have e3, very solid. We were insinuating that we might play knight e4. And I think this line probably illustrates at least one of the reasons that c6 is a little more passive than knight f6, or in Lamy's opinion, um, less precise. Because here we can play knight c6, which we sometimes play of our own volition, and here with tempo. So that's kind of good. And the pawn sacrifice is involved. I imagine we have tons of compensation though in the form of um, better pawn structure if they do take on c6. Um, the author is not really so worried about bishop a3 with tempo taking over all the dark squares, which I find worrisome, but you know, c3 is weak. Um, and he doesn't go into detail about queen c6. says f3 to stop knight e4. I thought knight e4 would be the response to um, queen c6 as it is. So we do this. And... Well, actually, we, in that other line, rook b8 has to come first, but then knight e5 eventually. Right, we're just opening the whole position because white's pieces look kind of funny here. Bishop g6 is just as good, they say, but they like this one. Wow, they're really leaving us hanging at the end of the lines here in this uh, in this short and sweet book. Bishop f5, exclaim, according to the author. We do, I think this first, yeah. Wait for e3, hit him with the Nimzo-esque things. Don't drop a bishop. Hit him with a right hook, hit him with a jab. Okay. Support with a pawn, so if they take, we take back with a pawn. Knight f6, which is a high class waiting move. Bishop b4, don't lose your bishop. Castle, again, don't lose your bishop. e5, open the position because they didn't develop their pieces. We take back because that's good for us. Don't lose your bishop. 
and then we're left in this mystery position on move 13. He gives this as an illustrative line, saying we have enough play for the pawn. Yes, we can keep playing moves, naturally. All right, we're near the end. There's only three lines left in this book. He's recommending bishop f5 against the London, which is which is good. I think there are other. I think Black has a luxury of choice against the London. So let's see how this one works. I guess this um, avoids redundancy with knight f3 and bishop f4. Because if we play bishop f5 against knight f3 and then they play bishop f4, we should be consistent. So that makes sense. Title drop, the queen's gambit. All right, so interestingly, he wants to meet queen b3 with knight c6, which is not unexpected because um, often black will try queen b6 and queen takes b2 in the London, and the way that white will often deal with it is with knight c3 and knight b5. So the thing that I'm wondering here is what happens if they take, I play knight b4 and they play queen takes c7. I guess we just take, take, and play knight c2. So there would be tactics there. But he's giving this as the, the line for us plebs who haven't bought the full course. We get to see how to punish this blunder with some basic tactics. So what a treat. Yerp, we're doing this. And this this and now it's Splunderville all over again development rapidamente obviously they can't take on b4 because of knight c2 that's a big fork family fork I don't know why the rooks in the family but you know they're all involved somehow Yeah, if you're brave enough, every move's a waiting move, for sure. Um, Jakester said that he learned today that Queen's Gambit started development in 2009 as a film starring Ellen Page. That is an interesting detail. I was under the impression that it was based on a dime novel or something. That is much older than the Netflix original trademark. Um, hmm, okay, so we have Knight of 3 as expected. Of course, what else? They were recommending f5 in a lot of earlier lines, but clearly we've played some moves that violate the possibility of playing f5. Also, I think you usually can't establish a successful stone wall against the very active white moves. We're playing knight c6 against queen b3 in pretty much every line, I guess. Um, knight a3, and they're recommending d takes c4, claiming it's the only good move. I guess so in this case because of the threat of queen c7. I was thinking rook b8, queen takes a7, rook a8, queen b7, rook takes a3 might be worth considering. But this is very logical because queen c7 is a way to avoid all that. Okay. Now here it turns out that queen takes, uh, sorry, bishop takes c7 is a mistake. Interesting. And this line looks actually more interesting. It says white is helpless against the threat of rook c8. I'll take your word for it, dude. And this is an important move to break through to the other side. Break on through. So I think we start like this. We just let him have it so we can get our knight on b4. I think you can almost do this as a matter of faith. It's not, not that important to actually always get the move order right. But in this case, we're presented with a quite nice move order. I like this move, c3. Active pieces.
D takes C4 is a funny move. I probably wouldn't play that in like a blitz game if I wasn't well prepared. I just wouldn't really think about it because of my own cognitive biases. MCAT has a good question. Doesn't this just look good for white? Um, if you mean the final position, I think it's very concrete. So it's easy to kind of look at the broad strokes and say like, okay, white has more pawns. White has pieces um, arriving on black side of the board. They could potentially castle quickly. But when you consider how, first of all, they can't castle because of this rook. And second of all, how rook uh, knight c2 is coming up with big threats against this rook. And they don't have really great moves to deal with it. Like rook b1 is met by bishop takes b1. Uh, so rook, rook d1 might be the only move that makes a lot of sense to deal with it. But this, at the very least, is giving back a pawn on a2. And probably more importantly, knight c2 check, king d2 is forced. And um, after knight e4 check, it looks rather painful to deal with this. Because you have to play king d3, and then knight takes f2 wins a rook, like a whole rook, possibly the game. Yeah, it's it's quite dangerous to allow anything. So if you play bishop takes b4 to deal with that, then bishop b4 is check. You have to play king d1. Bishop c2 is check. And now you're really playing with, with fire or something. Okay, so d takes c4. Let's go back to that one. Yeah, that makes sense to consider. Now, bishop takes c7 is a blunder. Um, rim score, yes, that's me. My... My channel on Twitch used to be Chess Players Made Better, and that's actually still my email for my YouTube channel. It's chessplayersmadebetter007 at gmail.com if you ever want to write to me. So yeah, totally still in it. Still doing chess content. Glad to have you back. Um, I did not disappear. I simply migrated to YouTube mostly, but also Twitch. I figured out how to dual stream. Anyway, so we were just talking about how this position might be um, interesting. Yeah, what if they do play normal move? E3, I think, has some problems. Let's open an analysis board here. I'm sure that in this free version of the course, they're not going to allow us to do any further stuff. Yeah, Rim Score, I still owe you a cookie. I am fully aware of that. Um, and actually, I live in Louisiana now. I think we already caught up about that. So. And that much closer to actually bringing you a cookie. I think you were in Florida. I, if I ever play a tournament in Orlando or something, I will bring you a huge cookie of my own design for being the first ever subscriber on my channel. Don't worry. We will make it happen at some point. You should just keep keep in touch so, so it's a little easier to do. Anyway, so we were talking, what if just E3? Uh, I'm going to flip off the engine just so that this is like more interesting and realistic. Um, bishop e4 I think was the notion in my mind by the way I find it just so insane how in, in chessable the arrows look way better in the analysis board than in the actual learning pane but the board is impossibly small anyway I, I just have so many gripes um, Yeah, Rimscore, I actually played in Orlando recently, and I got first place in the tournament. I would definitely have arranged for a cookie delivery if um, I'd been a little bit more in touch. Um, yeah, I've been pretty good despite various natural disasters and so on. Yeah, and Jakester was there. It was a, it was a really good time. I was glad to see, see the guys. Um, yeah, so life is like a minor disaster, but everything's good. I'm glad that um, you found me out here. So bishop e4, I think queen b5 is what they're doing. We might do something like c6, forcing queen c4. I think it's forcing that. Anyway, I think since, since queen b5 is coming up, we might want to try something a little bit more bold and brash. Or possibly belongs in the trash like knight d5 just saying I'm gonna pick off your bishop or maybe play rook b8 
for instance, knight d5, bishop g3, I think rook b8 works now. The idea here is that if you play queen a7, I play rook back to a8. You don't have a check here, um, so you might play queen back to b7, and then rook takes a3, takes, and then here. And let's check this with their weak engine real quick. It's suggesting queen d5, by the way. Um, so, and it says it's slightly better for black. I'm not sure how I feel about that. It, it's pro it's probably good. Um, but um, just to illustrate my idea, I was thinking this. And if they play like this normal move, then rook b8 is completely winning with this idea in mind. Winning a lot of material. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate the cheer. Thank you. Yeah, this is a, a sort of deep idea. I've seen this before with colors reversed. So this is kind of, well, not the same position, but, um, you know, I've seen something similar enough. Like when the queen is on b7, it sort of stimulates um, some ideas for me of either trapping the queen or utilizing its limited mobility for the counterattack. Um, and this is an equal option. So it's more likely they'll play like bishop c4 and develop their pieces and and this position it says it's slightly better for black i don't i don't know what to really think of that another idea that came to mind that the engine suggests is a6 and the idea here is that we are threatening to um at least repeat the position with rook b8 rook a8 um for example let's say they castle then rook b8 they have to play this move and i could at least force a draw here already so i'm definitely not worse even though it, it looks pretty reasonable for white in many ways. The queen is just oddly placed and punishing that seems to be pretty concrete. All right, let's pivot back to the book and just wrap it up for the night. I think we have only one line left. And if you guys came in late, I actually finished another short book earlier that is only for um, pro members on Chessable. So you guys can get a, an inside look without even having that if you want. Um, I like how they say 2e4 question mark poor move for the Blackmore Dimer Gambit and that is actually quite accurate. It's pretty bad and it's always interesting to see what different authors recommend to, to beat this one because it, it almost works. The idea for white is to um, give up material in order to get rapid development and I usually think of pawn takes f3 as um, complacent. It really gives white everything that they want. And even if the position is objectively good for black, I, I think it's a little practically difficult, especially in blitz, to deal with this. Um, so here they're recommending that we just take and then play bishop f5, and they're like cool with us being down in, down on development. I think queen f3 might also be a move in that position, although it's it's quite dubious. Um, c6 is a nice move. I like this move. The reason I like... So I like c6 earlier, too, because then they don't have knight f3, and we can quickly play e5. It seems like here, Lamy is trying to just, like, basically get the same pawn structure in all lines. Or in most lines. I'm already kind of cool with facing this myself, so interesting decisions here, but nothing, nothing really groundbreaking. Up, oh, that was a misclick. I think I'm due for a misclick at least once a day, so there it was. Glad I got that over with. All right, c6 here, and then e6. Um, bishop g6 to avoid rook f5 memes which wouldn't even exist if we hadn't played pawn takes f3. I'll just reiterate my gripe there. We chop, and we play c6, and we chop. Yay, we finished the whole course. How incredible is that? Um, just kidding, it's actually inevitable. All you have to do is keep clicking next, and you'll eventually finish any book on Chessable. So, um, I think that's probably it for now, and um, 
if you guys are here for the first time, welcome. I have a fan face-off coming up this week that I think you guys would like to watch. So if you want to know what kind of things I've planned, what's coming up, I usually schedule it on YouTube because YouTube has a better interface for scheduling things. And almost everything that I'm doing now, I'm, I'm streaming both on YouTube and Twitch. So you can choose what you want, but the schedule is usually on YouTube. Um, the fan face-off will be between two people who regularly watch the channel. I'll be giving live commentary, and then we'll hear from the players afterwards. So I expect that'll be really cool. And I, I hope to see you guys there. In the meanwhile, um, good luck with your chess. If you want to join our Discord or something, there's a link. Let me just generate a fresh link because I'm not sure that one actually works anymore. Um, I copy, I paste, everyone gets Discord link, yay. Okay, so if you guys haven't joined the Discord, that is an option for you. You're welcome to do it, and um, I'll see you around. If you ever have any comments or questions, just leave them in a, in a comment on YouTube, and I'll get back to you. All right, good luck. Take care, everyone.